and welcome to Nautilus TV, your trusted source of trade union maritime news. Today we have a wonderful lineup for you, including success at Lloyd's Register. Nautilus members have won a pay deal and union recognition after a two year campaign. We'll bring you the latest on that RFA pay dispute and the slow progress of autonomous ships and safety. With me today is Rob Coston and Sarah Robinson from the Nautilus Communications team. Hello guys. Hi. Hello, good to be here. Great, great to have you with us. Rob, we're going to start with that major victory for members in the Lloyd's Register case. As I said in the introduction, they have won themselves a pay deal and union recognition. Can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, situation there? Yeah, this is a really fantastic story. It's great for our members um, and, and a real credit to the Netherlands branch. Um, so a, a year and a half to two years ago, this all started when uh, two members that we had there, and there were only two, uh, came to us asking for Nautilus to represent them. Um, they'd gone to the employer, they'd asked for a pay rise because inflation had been really, really high in the Netherlands and they'd been given a very low pay offer. Um, and the campaign went from there. Uh, with only two members there, we weren't really able to do anything, but those two members and our team in the Netherlands helped to build uh, the support that we had there until now we have over 70 members in the company and after a really long battle in which the company didn't want to talk to us they didn't want to engage at all and they kept cutting off conversations after two years they've won a really fantastic settlement. Yeah, really, really pleased for them. That really shows the strength of grassroots activism within an employer, doesn't it? Of course, our officials were there to help and support them as we went through the two-year campaign. And I understand that you've had a conversation with our colleague Richard Moti in the Netherlands about that campaign as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what he said? Yeah, yeah. So I had a chat with uh, Richard. He's our executive officer there. Um, he's been really involved in all this. He takes us through the whole process from the protests they had in the Netherlands, starting out very nicely, trying to work with the company, uh, giving out ice creams, all the way through to a big protest in London um, that we did, and then sort of the legal elements that were brought in to really get the company to understand how serious we were and that we needed them to engage, uh, and through to the, the settlement they, that they ultimately won, which is very well deserved. Um, for the members and for the team there. Thank you very much for that Rob, really interesting case and well done to our members in the Netherlands and I know that we can cut to uh, more of that interview with Richard Moti now. We've been locked out but we're not giving up. We're not giving up, not giving up. Not Never. Giving up. Worth more. Uh, this story started almost two years ago, uh, more than one and a half year ago uh, to be more precise. Um, and uh, uh, workers of Lloyd's uh, themselves came to us uh, and asked us if we could represent them uh, because they tried themselves to ask their uh, employee uh, employer uh, a pay raise because of the high uh, rise of the cost of living in the Netherlands, the high inflation, which was in 2022, 14%. Uh, 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 and they only got... Uh, a pay rise of 2%. So there was a huge gap uh, and all those employees really felt it uh, uh, in the grocery store, at the tank station, paying their bills. Uh, it was a hard time for them. And the second question we asked our members was, okay, if we don't have an agreement, uh, and we, we reject the offer, but Lloyd's register uh, ended the conversations one-sided. And... Um, uh, stated that they will not uh, have further conversations with the union, with your representative anymore. What will we do? Uh, are, uh, do are we prepared to start industrial actions? Uh, and at that question, also 95, more than 95% uh, of our members and also the non-members, also the employees who weren't a member of, of uh, Nautilus, uh, agreed, uh, said yes, if, if they don't take us serious, we will take industrial actions. And that really changed the game with Lloyds. Uh, then they finally uh, realized that they wouldn't get away with ending the conversations one-sided, that they couldn't get away with the only giving their offer to a few colleagues and the rest, the majority nothing. Um, 
and in the uh, draft agreement we have we, ha we have uh, discussed with Lloyds we agreed with Lloyds the payment increments are uh, gone up to 250,000 uh, euros so five times higher than what they offered in their first final offer or in their final offer so we really uh, uh, improved the, the offer a lot and what I think is also very nice to, to, to mention in the draft agreement all employees will get it doesn't matter if you're in a low skill or high skill all employees will get 100 euros each month extra um, uh, um, every month uh, so in total that's uh, a pay increase of around 1200 euros uh, 1000 pounds um, and especially for the lower skills for the people with the lower incomes it, it is in percentage more than, than for the high skills so they are uh, compensated more um, uh, and next to that we also agreed on uh, a, a one-off payment of 400 euros um, um, so uh, it's really a good example by how a strong, what a strong union can be, uh, can 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 achieve if, and 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 how you can be a strong union if you work together, you join hands, um, and show courage, you can achieve a lot, and we showed it at Lloyd's Register. And staying with the theme of industrial disputes, the ongoing dispute between members and the RFA um, is a critical issue, of course, at the moment. Um, Rob, you've been all over that story. Can you tell us what the latest is, please? The latest is that we are still meeting um, with representatives of the government and the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Um, those meetings so far have been positive and we've had good conversations with them. People that we're talking to seem willing to make uh, concessions and do the right thing by our members. However, they presented us with a pay offer that was not nearly good enough, that wasn't able to meet the ambitions of our members or, or reflect the hard work that they do, and that certainly won't do anything to um, deal with the recruitment and retention crisis. My understanding of those negotiations is that was the first offer for a start. We've been waiting quite some time to get an offer. As you said, it is a very low offer and that we didn't feel that we could take that to members. On top of that, it's not even an offer for the disputed pay year, which is the 2022-2023 pay round. It's an offer for this latest pay round. Is that correct? And, and what do you think our next steps are? Yeah, that's right. Um, the next steps are to continue um, negotiating. We're currently balloting members on further industrial action. We need to do that by law. We need to keep, uh, keep that mandate for industrial action so that we can keep the pressure up and get our members' feelings across. Mm. Um, we're still very hopeful of a good result over time and um, we'll keep fighting for members on that. And I understand as we're recording this, there is another meeting with uh, government officials that is planned. Uh, are we expecting another offer from that or you know, what are we kind of hearing? We're working towards that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. we, we will obviously keep members posted about everything that happens as it happens. Yeah, great. So obviously this is a fast moving situation now that we've got these meetings in place. Um, if members want to stay up to date with that or viewers as well, please make sure that you're keeping an eye on our socials and on our website as well. You can keep an eye on our YouTube channel and we'll get some updates on that as soon as we can. And we can now go to a video interview with our colleague Martin Gray for some more information. It's always a difficult thing to have industrial action active. It's not a position that anybody wants to be in. And we recognise that the current government uh, is different to the ones in which um, austerity has been imposed, is different to the ones in which pay restraint has been imposed, and is trying to operate in a different set of circumstances and a different remit based upon that, that ideology. But fundamentally for our members, they have been doing so much of the legwork that sits and underpins the Royal Navy and Royal Marines operations for so very long that they are collectively fed up of the expectation being that they just get on and they just do, they just perform. And that has been the mantra and the mentality. And, you know, we're being assured that things will change, but we have been assured historically that things will change. We've had a number of pay results um, in the uh, period since 2010 through to the 2013, 2014 award that was imposed. We've had a series of things where we were promised 
that stuff will be reviewed and looked at in the future and cans have been kicked ever continually down the road and what is quite clear from the members is is that there's there, there can be no more of that we need to resolve some of the long-standing and historic issues and actually have a clear pathway for the future with deadlines, with targets, with milestones in there that allow for everybody to feel confident about the direction of travel and that allows for everybody to be able to identify really clearly what is going to happen, how is this situation going to be turned around. So recently we had two sets of talks with the Ministry of Defence and RFA representatives. One took place on the 10th of October, another took place on the uh, 16th of October. And we're talking around um, uh, uplift offerings. We're talking around changes in order to be able to pay for uplift offerings. We're talking about what those sums actually represent and what they mean in terms of value for individuals, as well as what the wider sort of concept will be moving forward. But unfortunately, there is a, a, a quite a distance between what the members have consistently been telling us is needed to represent an acceptable and agreeable solution for the dispute that we're in and allows for us to plan a pathway for the future compared to what the current government is able to, to, to offer and how far they are able to move. So um, I think there's going to be... Um, a great need for the ballot that is currently ongoing that would restore the mandate. Uh, we will get the results of that on the 4th of November, and there are still time for members at Royal Fleet Auxiliary to vote and participate in that. They haven't already done so. And with that, um, what we would expect to see uh, an additional six month mandate, there will likely be increasing industrial action in that area in collaboration with the members who are fed up. Now to the UK government's Employment Rights Bill, which was laid down in Parliament on October 10 and seeks to bring in some specific protections for workers and also for seafarers and other, other maritime workers. The bill seeks to improve protection for seafarers, but there are concerns that it still doesn't go far enough. So, Sarah, can I bring you in here, please? Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those protections under the Employment Rights Bill and uh, perhaps uh, the ones that are specific to seafarers and our members? So, one thing that we've been talking about at the Union for a long time now is outlawing fire and rehire. Now, that's something that I thought already was illegal in the UK, but apparently there are loopholes. Uh, so, what we're looking for is to outlaw fire and rehire completely by requiring employers to prove that there is no reasonable financial alternative to letting staff go. Um, and that's in the new bill. And so we're hoping very much that that's going to go through because that's a very important issue that was raised by the P&O Ferries uh, situation. Yeah, absolutely. That was back in 2022, wasn't it, when P&O Ferries summarily sacked nearly 800 of its workers um, and then sought to rehire some of those workers back uh, into their workforce. What, uh, what other protections, Rob, does the new uh, Employment Rights Bill have in it specifically for m the maritime workforce? Yeah, I, I think it's worth saying that this bill is something Nautilus has been pushing for, that we've been lobbying for, and that we're really pleased to see um, after years of the last government not really taking a proactive approach to protect seafarers after mm -hmm. the P&O ferries disaster. Um, so yeah, it introduces several different protections specifically for seafarers. Um, it toughens the law around collective dismissal, which is really important. It looks at seafarer wage protections under UK law. Obviously, we all know seafarers are in a really unique position, um, working on vessels with various different flags, working for employers that might be based abroad. This really toughens up some of those protections. Yeah, I mean, this is another thing that we we got very specifically in that P&O Ferries case, didn't we? One of the reasons why they were able to get rid of so many workers is that they had flagged out, which means that they had taken a flag of a different country with perhaps less regulation than uh, the UK and the UK flag would have. Um, what the law brings in is it extends some of those rights to workers on foreign flagged vessels, which again extends the employment rights, doesn't it? And um, what else 
else uh, would we like to see? We said that it doesn't perhaps go quite far enough, guys. What more would we uh, kind of like to see within the kind of drafting process of this bill? Well, we would like to push for some more legal support around safe roster patterns. So the reason that we are so against fire and rehire, I mean, obviously it's unethical to do at all, but when these companies rehire people, it's not always that they rehire people on low pay. It's often that it's on worse conditions. And the conditions that these companies are talking about is having people work for very long periods and um, stay on board their ship for a long time, which we think, and frankly, everybody in the industry thinks is not safe. So we are looking for safe roster patterns to be enshrined in law. And that means people being on board their ships for a reasonable amount of time before they can come off and have a rest with um, and particularly considering when the ships are crossing very busy shipping lanes because the people who work for example on the Dover Calais ferries have a much more intense job to do than people who might be on long distance ships or deep sea as we call them where they would have some periods of sort of downtime where it wasn't quite as busy. Yeah absolutely so those kind of journeys in between Dover and Calais it can be up to 10 journeys per day can't it a lot of fast turnarounds uh, a lot of juggling of work very fatiguing work so you know we would recommend something like a two on two off uh, shift pattern where seafarers would be working for two weeks on and then two weeks rest time off the ship yes. uh, something similar to that so thank you Sarah very much for that so uh, yeah Rob uh, what else yeah, are we looking I, for I within that we it's really important to get this in place with some kind of legislation or mm. some kind of protection from the government because mm. um, otherwise there will always be an incentive for operators to go for a low cost model to exploit their workers. If you have that baseline, that means all the operators have to stick to it and you won't get rogue operators undercutting the ones who act in a more responsible way. And we also have an interview with our colleague Martin Gray to give you a little bit more detail on that employment rights bill and how it's going to affect our members. Number of maritime aspects that um, are explicitly mentioned in the bill. Um, we've got the collective redundancy notification for ship's crews. So it modifies section 193A of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act 1992. And it clarifies that uh, clarifies its applicability with relation to redundancies of ships crews. So the bill specify that that section applies if an employer proposes to dismiss as redundant 20 or more employees at one establishment. So per vessel within a period of 90 days or less. And that modification in the bill ensures that the section applies to some all members of the ship's crew, even if they do not work in the same establishment. So it also goes a little bit further and helps get rid of some of the challenges that came forward through uh, Seahorse Maritime versus Nautilus International, where an employment tribunal ruled that for the purposes of an employment tribunal, each vessel was a specific establishment. So it goes a little bit further in supporting that actually the likes of P&O Ferries, for example, the entire vessel operation could be considered an establishment, certainly where you're looking at services where there's co-cooperation and where a workforce isn't necessarily limited to working on just the one ship they can work on a variety of vessels that are formulating either part of the service or part of the area within which the services are being operated so that goes and means that what they did in terms of not sending in a hr1 form of notification for redundancies to the uk government in good order or good time um, would be um, explicitly unlawful and would be opening up the company towards unlimited fines and uh, towards uh, challenges with, with respect to the suitability of the directors to be able to continue being directors. It would, it would put a question there, good standing. And it also, what the bill does is an extension of the redundancy consultation requirements. So it again amends the Trade Union Labour Relations Consolidation Act of 1992. Um, through that establishment. And it means that the Secretary of State will need to be notified. And it means that 
that you cannot get away with a Zoom call the same day after stopping the operations. So it would completely mean that any operator, um, any service provider, anyone who employs ships, crews that are in the UK and that would fall within uh, reasonable terms of links to the UK with regards to this legislation would need to inform the Secretary of State to let them know what the plans are in good order and good time. And as part of that notification to the Secretary of State, there will be a requirement to engage with employer representative organisations where they are recognised. And with PO Ferries, that would have been Nautilus International and it would have been the uh, National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers too. So it would have meant that the company would have had to enter into negotiations in terms of redundancies and changes to employment and would have um, allowed for both organisations to make representations that way. Next, we bring you highlights from the Nautilus Professional and Technical Forum. This is a regular event where members meet with colleagues to discuss issues of importance within the industry. And Sarah, you attend the forum regularly, don't you? Um, I understand that they were talking about autonomous shipping recently. Can you tell us a little bit more, please? So what David does in the presentation is that he gives a bit of an update on where we are with autonomous shipping. Um, he looks at how, he says it's, it was all the rage in about 2016 and we were going to all be um, out of a job by now because yeah. ships were going to be autonomous or at the very least remote controlled from shore and so there wouldn't be anybody on the ships anymore. And we were rather anxious about this at the time and our members were because how does that affect the, um, the collision regulations, the Colrex? Uh, who is in charge when something goes wrong? What about the role of the master? What about the insurance responsibility? All that kind of thing. So David was having a bit of a look at that and he talks about where we actually are here in 2024. Turns out that those restrictions and sort of some technical issues means that there aren't actually any fully autonomous ships out right. there at the moment. No, the, so we have a few remote controlled ones. Yep. Um, but most of those still usually have one or two people on board still. So the issue now is to try and get the regulations in place. And that's what was so helpful about what David talked about in his presentation. And that's what we're going to show you a clip on. He talked about how there is some work being done at the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which Nautilus is involved with, you know, for standard setting. But because the wheels turn, tend to turn very slowly at the IMO, there's also work being done involving Nautilus uh, at a national level in the UK and in the Netherlands. So David ran us all through uh, what's happening, what regulations are likely to take place. Um, are the nations dealing with this on a sort of case by case basis or is it possible to bring in a law that would sort of cover everything? And uh, that's what we're going to see in our clip today. Oh, that sounds really good. Let's head over to the clip. The slow progress at IMO and how it, the, the the scope of the code at IMO isn't necessarily going to apply to the vessels that are actually in existence now and actually being operated. There's been significant work nationally to um, advance the regulatory regime, uh, both in the UK and the Netherlands and other countries in Northern Europe. So in UK, the the MARLAB was established in 2018, which was aimed at addressing the um, the gaps that exist in legislation for mass. Um, there was a, a quite an extensive consultation exercise in last year completed was the future of transport regulatory review, which made a number of, number of recommendations as to changes that need to be made to national legislation. And it, it effectively proposed the development of a comprehensive national framework um, to allow for the operation of mass in national waters. Um, in the meantime, while obviously we've had a change of government and that consultation started under the um, the Boris Johnson Conservative government, so how much, uh, you know, how much has been lost in the various changes over the last couple of years, I'm not sure so, but in the meantime there is still work going on. Um, the UK is currently issuing exemptions to operators on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, essentially they have to make a safety case make a proposal for how they intend to operate and the mca assesses that on a case-by-case -case basis and either says yes or no or, or suggests conditions under which they would be able to say yes 
Um, the workboat code has been updated and now contains provisions to cover uh, remote control vessels under 24 meters. So effectively, if you have something classed under the workboat code that you can you can operate remotely, it needs to meet all of the existing requirements of the workboat code. But there's an annex for remote control vessels with additional requirements that it needs to meet. And another project that Nautilus have been heavily involved in is the developing of a competency framework for remote operators. Um, we can't give too many details exactly on what's being developed there because it, it is private until it's published. But essentially, we are developing a UK scheme to allow for the um, qualifications for remote operators, which are above and beyond the minimum level of SDCW qualification. Um, and we've also been in touch with the MCA recently just to um, basically express our concerns with how the development of the code is going at the IMO and how our perception is that certain stakeholders have more carry more weight in their opinions than others and subsequent to that we had a meeting with the chief executive of the MCA and we are we are now fully up to speed with uh, MCA policy and we are attending the first meeting next week of the inaugural uh, mass stakeholders group so that's that's a positive development and that will help us to get our points across and ensure that the the seafarer's opinion is taken into account when developing the UK framework Similar work has been going on in the Netherlands. The, uh, in 2017, a joint industry project on autonomous shipping was initiated, which involved 17 partners in the Netherlands, um, scoped uh, um, investigating autonomous technologies and also regulatory and other ba barriers to adoption. The Netherlands Maritime Technology Foundation has been coordinating efforts to develop safety plans and criteria for sea trials, which have been adopted and approved. And the Dutch government has been um, participating very extensively in the work at IMO as well to to, to you know, um, influence the direction of, of travel there. Um, and some specific projects that have happened in the Netherlands have been sea trials of, of various autonomous navigation systems. CZIP is a prominent one um, and some trials of, of some systems that can be retrofitted to to existing vessels and there's also been extensive research obviously in the Netherlands um, at, at Marin and other um, educational institutions. Now let's turn to the Netherlands where recent changes to the country's pension system could have major impact on maritime workers and uh, Sarah I understand that these reforms could really impact the retirement plans for many of our members in the Netherlands can you give us a little bit more information please yeah very much so um, so it's a story that we've covered before and if people want to have a look on our website they'll find some previous information about it but basically what's happened is that in the Netherlands as in many other countries they have made the retirement age later than it used to be. And at the moment, it's on 67 years. Mm -hmm. And the worry is that that's too late for people to be working in certain kinds of jobs. And we're thinking, we don't want our members to have to literally work until they drop. Um, seafaring is considered by our Netherlands branch to be heavy work, is how they describe it. And that means that maybe the hours are very long, like sort of 12 hour shifts or it's physically demanding. And that's the sort of job you don't want to be doing right up to the age of 67. So what they're trying to do is this. Now, you might think that it would be fairly straightforward to people, for people to retire on their company pension early even if they couldn't claim their state pension until the age of 67. Unfortunately, as I heard from my colleague Richard Moti, that's not the case. Mm. Um, you actually have to have a, an agreement with the government if you want to retire early, even if you're only going to be drawing your employer pension. So um, a little while ago, the um, Nautilus Netherlands branch, also working with other Dutch unions, managed to get a temporary concession for this. So what they're saying is that you could retire three years early on your company pension without having to pay a fine. Now that's the problem. If you, yes, if you want to retire early in the Netherlands, you actually have to pay a fine. So they managed to do this. They managed to get this exception for people to retire three years early in the Netherlands if they were in heavy work 
didn't have to pay the fine mm. and everybody was happy about this. But now what they're trying to do is to get it uh, made permanent. Mm. And that's what I was talking to you, Richard, about uh, in our interview. Uh, they're hoping for some progress. They feel like the, the government is engaging. Mm. Um, but, you know, hopefully watch this space and we'll have a bit more to tell you soon. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that sounds like a, a good win for Nautilus, but perhaps more to come. Rob, did you have some additional information? Yeah, there? I just want to say that um, in the Netherlands, the retirement age is actually tied to life expectancy. And as people live longer, they're going to be expected there to work more. So it's really important that we get this made permanent uh, because the situation will only get worse unless it gets resolved. Right, okay, so uh, even bigger pressure for our colleagues in the Netherlands to really get this agreement to be a permanent one as opposed to just a temporary one. Absolutely. Thank you guys, appreciate that. We're going to hear some more from Richard Moti now. It's really expensive to agree, uh, to make an agreement between a worker and an employer to have an uh, early retirement arrangement. That's why we in the past advocated a, uh, a new law and uh, to, to um, abolish this uh, tax fine. Um, and the government listened to that, uh, but only they only uh, implemented temporary. And that um, law will, will still uh, be valid after 2025. And what we are campaigning for now is to uh, abolish that law permanent to make it um, possible for everybody with a heavy job, uh, work night shifts, work uh, like seafarers, long hours, irregular hours, uh, to make it possible for them to uh, have an early retirement scheme without uh, having a, the absurd fine from the government. So are you happy with what you achieved before was to abolish the fine, but it was only temporary? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to make permanent in the next stage of the campaign? The third demand is that the government does not interfere in deciding what is a heavy job or not. Um, unions and employers are very capable to, to do that themselves uh, and we don't need uh, politicians to interfere with that. And how is that going? Um, have well, you managed yes. to get some promises from the government yeah, and yeah, who yeah. else are we working with on the campaign? Yeah. Well, this, this, uh, this campaign is a very broad campaign with a lot of unions in the Netherlands, uh, especially the FNV, which is the biggest union in uh, the Netherlands. And, and not, not this is also part of the federation of the FNV. Uh, workers uh, started with industrial actions. Uh, so... Uh, uh, and also as Nautilus, we, we joined these uh, actions, not by uh, uh, having strikes, but by signing petitions. Uh, more than half of, uh, more than two and a half thousand members, uh, seafarers have signed a petition for a better early retirement benchmark scheme. Uh, and we also had some um, uh, actions like uh, sounding the, the ship horns um, uh, when they are in, uh, in ports uh, and, and uh, yeah, just make some noise to, to get some attention for this uh, important uh, issue. Now we head to Morocco, where the International Transport Workers Federation recently held its annual congress, uh, where it attracted thousands of uh, workers from all over the world um, and was discussing the future of the transportation industry. Now, Rob, we are an affiliate of the ITF and we play a really strong part in helping to shape its policies. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that event, please? Yeah, it's a really important event. Um, as you said, thousands of workers from across the world will be attending that. Um, the ITF at the event is going to lay out its policy over the next five years. And we think that's going to involve talking a lot about the just transition, about moving transportation systems over to cleaner energy. And the ITF and Nautilus too are really concerned that that means workers like our members aren't left behind in that, that they get the education they need um, in order to work with these new systems, that it's safe and that companies are not using this as an excuse to uh, downscale their workforces, but that they are providing the best for them and, and giving them what they need to do their jobs properly. Yeah.
Yes, uh, so the just transition, it's a bit of jargon, isn't it? But um, what it means basically is keeping a fair deal for seafarers as we move towards ships with cleaner fuels. So you're on a ship, uh, we have a cleaner fuel such as hydrogen. Uh, is that going to put you in danger? Because uh, it's very explosive. Uh, are you going to have some training for it? And is your company going to insist that you pay for it yourself? Yeah. Stuff like that. That's what we're campaigning for. It's got to be fair to the workers. It's got to be fair to people who perhaps don't want to retrain because they're reaching the end of their careers, that they have a fair deal. And it's got to be fair to people who do want to retrain, uh, that they're not just laid off and you know more junior people taken on. So that's all what the ITF is working for. And obviously our members what they've said about their motion at our general meeting, that's feeding into that. Yeah. Um, so we are now, our colleagues are at the, um, at the conference in Morocco. Um, what we say feeds into the ITF's policy. The ITF is part of the Just Transition Task Force, which is um, essentially set up by the UN at the um, COP26 conference in Glasgow, uh, two or three years ago it was now. Um, and that's just one example of how your voice as a Nautilus member feeds into the ITF and then they use their influence, they amplify your voice through all of the other affiliate unions and they go to the IMO, the International Maritime Organization and other UN bodies and strengthen numbers. They speak on behalf of everybody and they get things done. Well, thank you very much, guys, and we can now go over to a clip from colleagues who attended that event. The theme of the Congress revolves around six rights, six themes, six action programs. First one is rights for transport workers. The second one is equality for transport workers. The third one is safety and health of transport workers. The fourth one is shaping the future of work, new technology, artificial intelligence. The fifth one, accountability in the supply chains. Things like human rights due diligence, this is really important to see for us. And making transport sustainable. So that's about the environmental changes that we face and the just transition. Now, Northwest members will be very familiar with these themes. Last year, we had our general meeting. These themes were prominent in all of our discussions. That's why we're here, really. We're here to advance the voice of our members, their working experience, their lived experience, make sure their concerns and interests are taken account at the international level. Fundamentally, our activities as a union at the international level are really important. This is where we set the policy of transport workers. This is where our position in this global movement is set. When we go back to our regions, when we go back to our countries, when we go back to our branch meetings and we work together, across our one union is known as international, we have developed the appropriate policy responses to frame the debates that will follow at the national level, the region level, and the global level. Our industry is top down, it's a global industry. If we're not involved internationally, framing the policies, framing the interventions that unions and our union federations will make at the international regional level in support of us nationally, then it's all over. Now we uncover a hidden gem in the maritime community, Mariners Park Radio Club based up in Wallasey. And Sarah, you've been to see the club. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, it was a really great visit. So the members of the club are retired radio officers. Now a lot of them uh, used to do the job of radio officer and then became electrotechnical officers later in their careers. But um, when they were radio officers, which is pretty much 1970s, okay. at that time, um, it was quite old school. They had to learn Morse code and they had this transmitting and receiving equipment. Um, and now they're going back to that, their first love. So they have transmitting and receiving equipment um, in their club. And um, every Friday, they all get together. It's not just people who live our in Mariners Park, which is our retirement estate uh, in Wallasey on the River Mersey. Um, other retired radio officers come in every Friday from the region so that they can all take part. And 
uh, in my video, I uh, meet some of them and they explain what it is that they do. Well, that sounds like really good fun. And I know that we have a little bit more detail now. So let's go over to that clip. Stan McNally, who are both long-standing Nautilus members, and they're going to tell us a bit about the Radio Club and where it started and why it's here now. It started with uh, historic warships, which is the ship where they signed the uh, war. Trying to get removed. They signed the treaty in 
Um, and then they got into consultancy, started opening restaurants, making um, hotels into wedding venues. Um, we made a bit of money from that. So my wife wanted to move out to Florida. Um, and I needed a job where I could come in and out of the country um, and still get to cook some amazing food. So I looked into the super yacht industry and mm -hmm. um, been about seven years now, quite wow. enjoying it, been all over the world, um, yeah. been working on some really big boats and some really small ones as well. Um, really very career in the industry, been uh, in the med a lot, um, but most of my time is over in the Caribbean and the Bahamas. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm glad that was the whistle stop tour because you've done so, so, so much there. What I really loved to hear a little bit more about was that work that you did with the students when you were producing those YouTube videos, because that sounds quite innovative and ahead of its time. What kind of gave you that idea to record the videos for the students? So we had a, um, a partnership with another college that taught students with speech and language issues. And they yeah. would come into the college and do like practical lessons, like apprenticeships almost. Um, and one of those was uh, like they did hairdressing, they did catering, they did motor mechanics, or, or, you know, all different types of things. And I had them for two days. I had them on a Tuesday and a Thursday. And um, my Tuesday lesson, I would demonstrate what I was going to cook. And then on a Thursday lesson, we'd cook it. Only that doesn't work when you've got speech and language issues, you know. There's just right. so much going on in their lives. They just couldn't, they couldn't remember the information or take it in. So yeah. we came up with the idea on one of the staff meetings that we would record the videos of the of the dishes and then the students would get them, played to them a lot. And whenever they wanted um, you know, the opportunity to see it, they'll be able to see it. So we started uploading them to YouTube and we created an account for all the students. Um, and their support workers thought it was fantastic. We extended the time out and we'd do the videos on the Thursday. And so they had almost a whole week before the Tuesday before they cooked the dishes. And the improvement level was fantastic. You know, these kids were going from just not understanding what was going on in the classroom um, when they came to cooking to actually producing the dishes. And um, it was the first year this has ever happened for, their, for those students. And the idea just took off. It was called flipped learning. I okay. learned it off an American, um, American teacher that was promoting at the time. So okay. the idea is you give the student all the information for the class, let them kind of just figure it out and then show them how to figure it out. And because you're reaffirming the information, you uh, it sinks in and works. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And I wonder if there's application to introduce a similar type of learning in the super yacht industry for yacht crew when they're going through yeah. their training. Well, you just watch Below Deck, right? <laughs> what not to do perhaps <laughs> how to get fired 101 exactly like how to lose your certificates but uh, speaking of certificates I mean you've transitioned from you know pretty much a land-based um, career land-based chefing to working on super yachts you can't just you know kind of do that without perhaps doing a little bit of training and get your certification so get you know um, your your kind of legal requirements to be able to work on board a yacht can you kind of walk us through that for people who might be interested in making that same transition yeah it's actually really hard um Isn't i was uh, at the level of um consultancy so i was opening um restaurants um in as my career as a chef so you know figuratively speaking i was kind of like doing really well making yeah. a lot of money doing really yeah. well and then got into yachting and had to start right at the bottom so the, the safety courses I had to do is called a SCTW. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone in, in yachting, anyone in, in boating has to have that kind of That's certificate, right. right, if you're doing it um, and making money from it. Uh, and an ENG one. So they were the two basic things. Um, and I went off to a place down in Kent. I went once a week because I couldn't do the full weeks. So I had to work as well because these things aren't, aren't that cheap. As, they're around £2,000 for me, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and over a week. And you do firefighting, uh, which is really interesting. You're actually putting out fires, which is pretty cool. Uh, it kind of scares you a little bit when you realise that you're going to be on a big lump of uh, stuff that burns floating in yeah. the water. And you're yeah, responsible alongside the rest of the crew, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, we do um, like personal life-saving drills, um, which was funny going to the swimming pool and learn how to rescue each other and how to swim and how to stay together in a in like a... A circle so they can rescue and find you yep. and then you think it's all fun and then you're all holding hands and you're thinking oh I really don't want to do this in the ocean it's a it's a huge responsibility and obviously in the super yacht industry we have guests on as well so mm -hmm. I've done um, extended courses to work on big boats where I've done crowd control um, um, and, and management pro uh, protocols like that to deal with you know the numbers of guests and, and, and in serious situations my military background gave me a, a huge kind of bonus in that because I'm very well trained in first aid battlefield medic um mm -hmm. so the first aid on board for me 
on the SCW, SCW was like a, a refresher. I'm talking to refreshers. I just did mine in, in December, but I wasn't able to refresh. I had to do the whole thing again. Oh, my goodness. Why? Because um, it had elapsed. They okay. only last five years, right? Right. And I'd been, um, so I'd been working on yachts and then I got a job on land um, flying from New York and um, Florida, feeding a very rich guy uh, into finance and stuff, which was As cool. As you do. Uh, but, but yeah, my, my, uh, all my licenses, all my CTW all elapsed, so I had to do those oh, no. again. Oh, no. Um, the A&D one you do every year, right? Yeah. I think every year. So, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, wow. fun. it was fun to do it all again. It hadn't changed much. Um, no. But it's nice to have that camaraderie with the rest of the people on that group. So I've, yeah. I've stayed in contact with a few of them. Uh, just got another chef a job, actually. He's out in the Bahamas now. Oh, I that's met in the brilliant. Group. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to see the new new people coming into the industry and, and really enthusiastic and the old salty sea dogs that are sitting there going, <laughs> this is the last time I'm doing this. <laughs> well, no, you can you can never turn your back on the sea, though, can you? Once you're there, it kind of just no, gets you. you. Yeah, it absolutely. Does. It's those sunsets and sunrises, right? I <sighs> love them. I live for them. Yeah. Well, that might be all you see, though, as a super yacht chef. Don't you uh, spend a lot of time in the galley? Yeah, they call us galley goblins. I never have a tan. <laughs> Look at me. I've been out on a cruise ship for a week. Um, we've been no. filming as the guest chef. So I've had the days off. I've been, you know, out on the beach doing the excursions um, yeah. and then cooking in the evening. So, yeah, I've got oh. a bit of a tan at the moment. But usually I'm white as a ghost. Yeah. Never see the daylight. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I'm based in London and I almost have a better tan than you. So what's going on there? (laughs) (laughs) It shouldn't be the case. So, but it was really interesting you talking there about, you know, your experience of having to get trained and do all quite extensive training, really. Um, And that you have to, if your certificates are lapsed, you need to do them because they only last for five years. That's probably not something that a lot of people are aware of if they've just come to the super yacht industry through TV programs or through through social media um what else do you think is there anything else that you think that people should be aware of if they are considering entering this industry um yeah definitely as a chef um your kind of land-based background is almost irrelevant um it's all about sea time um, and you're dealing with so many different more more different problems or problems that are different on in the on the ocean you know there's trying to uh, get in hold of products um getting provisions on board there's so much more management of, of the catering of a boat than there is, than you'd think about. Um, and a lot of the things that we take for granted on land in, in restaurants and um, cafes, you know, around the world, they're just, they're just not available for you on a yacht. You've got what you've got. You've mm. got to stock it up. And if mm-hmm. things start to go wrong on the boat, you've got to deal with it. And the guests have got to have that, you know, that 100% every time. The food's got to be perfect. And it's difficult. It really is. It's very stressful. It's long hours. Yeah. I've been a sole chef on 50-meter yachts for a long time and it's just me so you've yeah. got to wash the pots you've got to peel the potatoes you've got to <laughs> put, pack it all away you've got to get it all out again and you've got to keep going it's long hours it's difficult yeah. um, and I don't think a lot of people coming into the industry realize that they see the programs like uh, below deck and they think oh their life's going to be good and it is good it is good it's you know we're in beautiful locations but the work is hard uh, it's long hours and you kind of irritate each other you know there's like a cabin fever that happens you're Everyone in close gets quarters a bit out. yeah yeah and you don't really see that. They try and make it fun on the show, but uh, it's not that it's not that fun in reality. Uh, <laughs> we're but, just waiting for the guests to go. Off. No, 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 we're not. <laughs> so, so what would an average day look like then for you as a chef on a on a CPR? So me, I'm usually up about half five, but I'm early okay. riser anyway, so I enjoy okay. that. Yeah. Um, get up, shower, um, and then start breakfast. And this is like the pastries, all the bacon, all the things that I know guests are going to eat I get that cooked um, and then the crew start getting up around me so the um, uh, the early girl I shouldn't call her that really the early stewardess would be um, setting up the breakfast table we have the um, the night guy would be finishing his shift so he'd be rinsing the boat down drying it off um, uh, and then as they get up I might offer them some eggs give them some bacon feed them as they come through the galley because the galley is kind of the hub of the boat everyone kind of gets up gets their coffees and yeah, has right, a you're also and then my day the- would be you're also oh, yeah, feeding yeah, the yeah. crew, right? Because mo- yeah, some people am, might yeah. think it's just the guests, but it's not. It's literally everybody on board that ship. The crew are the most important people because they eat my food every day. <laughs> guests only after a week or two, but the Shh, food don't tell the, guests. the crew has to be, you know, have to keep it on point all the time because yeah. they get they get they get used to it and they start complaining. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so I interrupted you there. We're at the breakfast. Sorry, yeah. So then, yeah. But, so then I'll start doing. Um, I'll start doing uh, crew lunch, prepping that. And as I'm prepping crew lunch, I'll start getting guest orders in. So about nine, ten o'clock, the guests will okay. start ordering hot breakfast, like egg benedicts or some waffles, pretty much whatever they fancy. Um, and I have to get that ready quickly and, and serve that to. Um, by this time, the chief stew, who's up, she normally does service for the guests for breakfast. The, the guests get organized to see what they're going to do for the day. I'll go up after breakfast and speak to the principal and ask them about the menu. So I usually produce the menus the night before, but we take them up at breakfast and they, we get to talk about them. If anyone wants to change anything, what they want to have for lunch, if they're going on an excursion or if they're not going to be on the boat for dinner or anything like that, we talk about and I secretly celebrate <laughs> if they get off. <laughs> no, no, no. I would love cooking for them. It's a bit, no, um, and then um, get into crew, crew dinner. So usually crew, din uh, crew lunch goes out. Um, guest lunch starts getting prepared. We usually have that about one o'clock. Crew lunch will go out at 12. Um, then it's a little break for me. I usually take off an hour, an hour. I like to get some sun. Yeah. <laughs> I like to go to the bridge and speak to the captain. Usually I hang out with him for a while yeah. um, or, or, or hide in my cabin like a, a little goblin um, <laughs> and then get ready for dinner. Um, so then it's crew dinner and, and then um, guest dinner. And guest dinner is normally quite casual. Then it starts to relax for me because I haven't got anything else to cook. I might prep my dessert for the next day. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a full on day. Usually yeah. around 15, 15 hours, starts 5.30 in the morning, the galley by six, finish wow. about nine, 10, maybe 11 at night. Wow. I'm exhausted just hearing about it. I, I assume that's in the peak season, so over the summer season, that would be... That'd be yeah, guests, that'd be guests on. So yeah, yeah we do that, what, two times a month, maybe two weeks out of a month. Two weeks. All right. So would you be typically working two weeks on, two weeks off, or are you also working even without guests on board? Yeah, I'm just feeding the crew without guests on board. Right. And then there's lots of inventory to be done, um, yep. cleaning. Yeah. I try not to clean as much as I can on guest trips because it takes up time so we do all the deep cleaning when the guests are off so take yeah. all the drip cupboards out sort everything out also there's lots of different rules for different countries of what produce and food that can take in so for example we just came back from the bahamas for a two-week trip and we're coming back into the u.s and then the boat was going to cruise around and took it later on so it has to get a different license and it has to be purged so i had to kind of run my stocks down on the on the charter and then come in with like nothing and then wait for the purge to happen before I could buy new food and then stop feeding the crew again. Wow. So it's little management, things like that you've got to deal with. And you don't normally get that at a restaurant. Yeah, you don't normally get that. And I'd never thought about that. But I guess when you mention it, you know, I'm from Australia and I know that if you go into Australia, you can't bring any food with you and you will literally get stopped by those border police, right? And told to bin whatever you've got on you. So I, I can see how different countries would apply those type of laws to maritime space as well as, you know, people coming in via airlines and other routes as well. Yeah, I mean, we're going down all into the Caribbean. So lots of different islands, different countries. You know, I've been in St. Bart's, which I think is French, um, St. Martin on the Dutch side and the French side, uh, into the BVIs. So we've checked into a bunch of different places. Yeah. And I guess the U.S. state, Florida, want to, I know it's New York, actually, that are making us do it. That state want us to be purged of any fruit or vegetables or any yeah. meat that, from those countries. Wow. Um, so we had to do it. Oh, of course. Yeah. You can't say no to the uh, state regulators, can you? They won't be letting you... Not if we want a, not if we want a cruising <laughs> licence. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, it's full on work. This is not for the faint hearted, right? How does a, a land-based chef get into it? Do you need to be some type of celebrity chef? Do you need to be, you know, have worked in a Michelin star restaurant? What's the kind of bar or what's the litmus test to be a good super yacht chef? Well, it's interesting because there's so many different boats. You yeah. know, you could be fresh from college, get on a boat as maybe a, a chef stew, you know, with four crew um, and have a good career and make lots of money. Or mm -hmm. if you wanted to get into the big boys, you know, the 100 meter pluses with three or four different chefs in the in the kitchen, then you'd need some Michelin star experience. And then there's wow. a big, big chunk in the middle where it's like, you know, 40 meters to kind of 60 meter boats. That's the main majority of charter boats at the moment. Um, and those chefs are, are, again, from all over. Um, I think you need to have a, a solid background in lots of dishes. You need to be able to bake bread. You need to be able to make pastries. You need to be able to make dessert. You also need to be very wise in um, looking after your stores and using up your um, produce in a way that um, maximizes its freshness. You know, so you're not putting on delicate salads at the end of your trip. You've got those all at the start because your lettuces aren't going to last. You've got to have a mind for thinking, logistics, um, 
it's difficult it's hard but it's not impossible uh, it's really hard to break into the industry because captains don't want to employ chefs without sea time right. so you have to take the the low-paid jobs to start off with and then work up right it's I, really, I guess it's a it risk really right it's a risk yeah, it for, is, but yeah. It's, it rewards a lot it, it pays maybe two or three times as much as i would in a in a restaurant stop really that yeah. much yeah, it's very lucrative. I think chef, engineer, and captain are the three highest paid on boats and, and is, on super yachts. And is that outside of any bonuses you get? So just your basic salary would be two or three times what you get in a land-based restaurant? No, I'd include my tips in that because the tips are very, very generous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Hence the attraction for many people. Yeah. Yeah. It, it attracted me. Yeah. I've not, I've not left. I quite like it. <laughs> There's, and there's no harm in that whatsoever. We are and there's all... a boat for everybody. If yeah. you can get in, there, there's a program that will suit you and, and okay. suit your lifestyle. Some okay. people like to travel the world and, and there's those boats. Um, and there's ones that just, you know, sit in Florida and run to the Bahamas every weekend. There's those boats too. Well, that's it for this edition of Nautilus TV. Thank you so much to Rob and to Sarah for joining me. It's a pleasure. Nice to have you with us. You can get all your trade union news on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share with your friends and colleagues. And remember to stay engaged with your maritime trade union because together we are stronger. Thank you again and see you next time.